This evening we have Deb Reekman from Associated Press, White House correspondent, to talk to us about how she does her work and uh, how coverage has uh, worked over time with other news organizations as well. Gives us some comparisons. Um, so, Deb, uh, <laughs> let's uh, let's talk about your day to day. Last week, remember, we had uh, Tony Fratto, the Deputy Press Secretary, who was telling us about his upcoming trip to Africa, and he talked about uh, the trip. From your angle, how are you having to deal with that trip? Because they're now in Africa. Well, that means that I work Africa hours. Sometimes uh, it's plus seven, plus eight, whatever it is, wherever the country he's in. Um, we're taking the copy that our people on the ground are producing and putting out a story from Washington, even though it's state-lined in Dar es Salaam. Dar es Salaam, or right now they're in Rwanda, now they're in Ghana. And so we're constantly just, uh, we call it the trip desk. Uh -huh. That's what we call it. And you kind of walk in in the middle of the night in a, a sleep stupor and and start filing news alerts to the world about what Bush is saying. So it's quite challenging. How fast is it? Uh, so like say um, they file a report at um, noon, their time. Um, when does it come to you and what do you do with it? It's usually I hear it as they're hearing it and we're moving it together. Ah. We're, you know, we're putting out Bush words as he speaks. Uh -huh. It's that quick. I mean, he, he said the other day, um, you know, something on, uh, it's, it, it all becomes a big blur. I, I don't know uh -huh. sure I can pull, pull, this, pull these examples Which off. Which country? Um, well, we were in Dar es Salaam for a couple of days, so yeah, it had right. to been there. He did press conferences with the different leaders as he's gone through this, the countries. And whatever he says that's, you know, news alertable, uh -huh. I put it out. So from Washington, we're filing. And people are in the press conference, so obviously they're not able to file. Uh -huh. And then sometimes our other person, we always cover him in tandem, Sometimes our other staffer is in transit uh -huh. without cell phone coverage, whatever. So I'm actually running at it at that point. Uh -huh. um, and then they'll come back in and pick up the story and make it theirs. How are you hooked in on the sound? Are you uh, hooked in on the picture as well or just the sound? It's spotty, but we do have uh, White House feed uh -huh. and TV pool feed. So whoever's the pool the day, uh -huh. whoever's, whichever network is handling that, the pictures for the day, is piping it into a channel that I can access. Uh -huh. I can usually always access audio, sometimes sound, uh, sometimes video. Uh -huh. And what kinds of things are news for you? Are they... Um... Well, lately, we thought this was going to be an easy trip, you know, we thought this was going to be, you know, Bush goes from one AIDS clinic to another, and instead we have you know, Castro retiring, we have uh, Rice going to Kenya to mediate, you know, political crisis. We have Kosovo declaring independence. We have mm -hmm. all kinds of things going on. And, of course, right before he left, there was this big uh, brouhaha about the intelligence bill. So right. there's plenty to write about. Uh -huh. and, and whatever he says on any of those issues, obviously, is news. So we peel off and write about that separately sometimes from the Africa's story itself. Do you have... Um, it, it's quite challenging, and it's, it's very fast moving, and you're doing it at 3 o'clock in the morning, uh -huh. <laughs> and no one is around looking at you, <laughs> and you're furiously punching and filing. And do, you, do, you have, um, do you have an editor that's, uh, that's going over it? Uh, oftentimes, we have uh, two people on the trip desk at this, at this particular point. We have just myself, and then an extra person when they have a press conference. Uh-huh. And when you're um, looking at it and you're deciding what's, um, what's news, what's newsworthy, how many different communities are you thinking of and different markets are you thinking of? Well, you know, I'm in contact with Nairobi and with London mm -hmm. throughout this evening, you know, throughout the night. And, 
you know, we know what they want. Uh huh. Right. So I'm perfectly apprised as to what is uh -huh. needed out there in the world of news. Like, you know, everybody was anxiously waiting for him to say something about Kosovo, uh -huh. anything about Kosovo, and the White House was was holding back because there was no official declaration from the State Department. So the White House was sort of trying to wait for the formal legal uh -huh. recognition to occur before they said anything. But then Bush decided to go out and say something on uh, the Today Show. So that uh -huh. created quite a furor. And he said the Kosovars are independent. Nobody knew exactly if that meant that the United States legally had recognized Kosovo or uh -huh. if Bush was just chatting. We wrote it, but it was unclear as to the, uh, yeah, you know, the importance of it. But we wrote it as a, as a news alert. Uh huh. Then what do you do, after, <clears throat> after you've written that as a news alert? Then how do you go about nailing that down? Are you in your White House booth? No, we're. Uh, or you're at AP. We're at the Bureau Penn Central. Yeah, uh -huh. we're, that's where all the technology is for this. So. Uh huh. Uh, well, you know, it was clear that he was speaking out ahead of the State Department. It was clear that legally the United States had not yet recognized the Kosovo. So it was just a matter of Bush words on this issue, and that's how we played it until there uh -huh. was more. Then um, do you do you keep after the White House? Oh yes, we were. I was in touch with. I was emailing the National Security Council people and uh -huh. Dana Prino and everyone to get more on this. What does it mean? Our people on the ground obviously are, are standing right next to them and are haranguing them for yeah. whatever they can get and forwarding it up to me. In term, in, sometimes it's email, sometimes it's a phone call, sometimes it's a flash message. It uh -huh. depends on how, where they are and what the communication What's a flash, are. Mes flash message? That means that they are on the AP line and we could communicate by just simply... Like an IM? Kind of like, yeah, like an instant message, exactly. Uh -huh. And if that's not, if they're not online, then they're emailing with their BlackBerry, you know, Dana Perino said this, uh -huh. and I'm taking that information and putting it out uh -huh. onto the wires. Um, would the State Department back here, uh, the people here, be uh, responding, or are they just going to go along with whatever um, those with the president say? Well, it's, it was a coordinated effort. Bush just got out a little ahead of it, that's all. Uh, when the TV reporter asked him about Kosovo, he responded and, yeah. and the world went mad. I think one of the broadcast stations internationally used Bush's comments as confirmation that the U.S. had uh -huh. recognized, Already recognized it. Kosovo, but legally it hadn't happened. And I, I at least knew that that was true, so I backed off a hair uh -huh. until it was a formal thing. But that's just uh, semantics, you know. Uh -huh. I mean, it was it was going to happen. We knew it was going to happen. It was just a matter of when. So you do just you have to be careful how you write it. Do you find that the uh, the communication setup is um, is easy to work with at the White House? No, no. When you're uh, doing uh, Africa, well, say on the Africa trip, is it? Uh, is it easy? Because you know they're going to areas where the communication system is not so good, but they bring their own system with them, right? I mean, Tony was talking about how they have to, you know, bring their own communications <coughs> for a lot of things. Well, there are times when the White House people are not in email communicado. Uh huh. And you know, uh -huh. I, I emailed somebody from the National Security Council before I left today and said, you know, we need a reaction on Pakistan elections. Uh huh. And he said, I'll be out of email traffic for the next five hours. So uh -huh. then we're dependent on people, our people on the ground to uh -huh. get to him. But then again, he's dependent on his own email to get the information to give to us. So uh -huh. In the, the it, it sometimes gets held up. And the but I mean, around the world, it's not that bad. I mean, there uh -huh. are very few places around the world where we can't. Uh -huh. It might be a delay, but... I mean, Air Force One can always make a phone call, uh -huh. and if there's a briefing on the plane, they can call the White, you know, the Washington Bureau, and and we can get it out. 
the other day was interesting. We had, when there's news that's made on Air Force One, and they do what they call a wire call, where they get the White House operator to get the different wires on the phone all at the same time for a conference call, and then the reporters on the plane dictate what news has transpired. Huh. And in this case, we couldn't get one of the news organizations on the phone. Of course, it was only like, you know, 2.30 in the morning. And uh -huh. apparently the White House had the wrong phone number. And <laughs> we were probably on hold for a good half hour uh -huh. waiting for the third news organization to find someone. And finally, they called somebody in London, uh, somebody from that organization in London to get them on the line. And uh -huh. we could go forward with the call. How does that call work? I've, I've not heard of it. If there's a briefing on Air Force One and the, wi and the wire yeah. reporters believe it's news that needs to go out quickly, uh -huh. they will ask the White House staff to get the operator to make the call from the plane. Then that call is transferred back to the press area on the plane, and the Reporters pick up the phone, and we are all on the line at that point in a, in a kind of a conference call, and they dictate uh, quotes from various officials. Well, it's, that would be used, say... And then we handle it completely from, from here. Uh-huh. If, um, uh, let's say, if Condoleezza Rice were to give a briefing. Correct. And or, had, or the National Security Advisor Hadley. Uh-huh. Or Dana Perino, the White House spokeswoman. Any of those people. Uh huh. And would it be done almost all of the times when they came back and did briefings that you'd no, have to do? No, we don't do. Kind of call? We call those wire calls. Um, no, we do not do wire calls every time there's a briefing on Air Force One. Only if, if it's a situation in which the plane is not going to land for several hours and the news is of urgency. Uh huh. And that decision is made by the reporters on the plane. Uh huh. How does this kind of uh, way of putting a story together compare with at the White House? When, when uh, you're in your booth at the White House and the President is in the West Wing and um, things are, like say last week, compare this kind of operation with last week. Um, are you able to get the same kind of news out? And how, does your, how do things usually work for you? You usually don't work in the middle of the night. No, thank God. <laughs> Although lately it's, it's, and for the rest of the year it's going to be, yeah. sometimes if it, the, the deal is with, with our organization is we have four people who cover the White House for the Associated Press. Whoever is not on the trip works the trip desk. So, for example, I'm not on the trip this time, therefore I'm on the desk. Uh -huh. And this rotates. I'll be on the trip maybe the next time or the next time. And How many all, people are you rotating? Four. Uh-huh. Four people. And sometimes we do have to bring in some extra people to help out with the staffing. But the way it works in the White House really is not a whole lot different. Uh, we have people in the booth who are listening to the president as he speaks and are moving stories out before our staffer, who is actually in the speech or the room or right. wherever he's making news, comes back and then takes the story back. And we call it makes it pretty, makes it... Uh -huh makes it theirs. Uh -huh. But it's pretty much the same, uh, same deal. We put out a news alert. We put out uh, a couple graphs. We put out more ads. And we continue to add until we're done with the news that we have to impart. And then we do what we call a write-through, which kind of brings it all back together and puts it in one big story, one place. Uh -huh. And it's a constant 24-hour cycle. So we're doing this furiously 24 hours a day. How many, uh, how many words would you put out a day, and then how many different, um, uh, different stories would you be writing throughout the day? I know you, that you're going to be um, adding <coughs> to stories, but um, how many different ones? And There have been days when I've dealt with more than eight or nine different issues, uh -huh. which is extremely taxing mentally because we're talking about issues that are extremely complex and you're kind of parachuting in for a moment to uh -huh. tell what the president has said about a given issue and then moving on to the next. Mostly it's usually a couple a day, a couple of issues a day that you're dealing with and maybe you'll write 
anywhere from 300 to 1,000 words on uh -huh. a given event. And then other days, it's very busy, and you might write five or six stories that are 400 words apiece. Uh -huh. Or it just depends on what happens. What are the kind and of... And also, we're feeding to stories. For example, if the president speaks to a foreign leader, we then write a few paragraphs and send it to the foreign capital uh -huh. that might be then writing about whatever their leader is doing that day, and they can say, oh, yeah, by the way, uh -huh. you know, Bush spoke to so-and-so. Uh -huh. So we're f constantly feeding, and we're also constantly getting White House information on stories that are being written by other people in Washington at our bureau, in Washington and around the world. So there could be inquiries from Beijing, for example, or could you get the White House com to comment on blank issue in uh -huh. North Korea or whatever. <clears throat> How many of those would you get a day that where you're going to be adding to? Two or three, a couple a day, I think, uh -huh. would be would they, pretty normal. Would those uh, mostly be coming from abroad or from the U.S.? No, they would be coming from abroad. It depends on the time change. You know, you'll get yeah. different ones at different kinds of time during the day. Uh -huh. And you do your best to get a White House comment. Sometimes it, we're just farming the comments out because they have come up on the briefing, for example. Uh -huh. Maybe during the briefing, the White House has commented on Pakistani elections or the Iran nuclear crisis or the election here or something. Yeah. And then we will grab those comments and farm them out to whomever's working on the story for us. Uh, one of the, the challenges of the White House feed is what you s spoke of, that you may be doing nine different stories, and they deal with different subjects. Uh, how does uh, AP prepare its reporters for the White House? What kind of background did you have, um, say, uh, work back at the, uh, at the Bureau before you came to the White House that familiarized you with the variety of things that a White House deals with? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. I, I, I think that, I think journalism is a trade. Uh -huh. I think it's a skill. I think it's a, uh -huh. something you learn on the job. You can go to school and learn this, but unless you do it, you don't know how to do it. Mm -hmm. You can learn the, you can learn the craft but until you practice it, you can't do it well. Mm -hmm. So it's almost to me as, a, as if I've gone to a trade school. Uh -huh. And then because college teaches you how to learn, uh -huh. you then go out and figure this all out yourself. Uh -huh. I spent a lot of time reading State Department briefings uh -huh. and think tank pieces on given subjects to keep me familiarized with what's happening and with the different... Uh, issues are, it's it's difficult because there's little time for this. So you spend, you find yourself laying in bed at night with a stack of papers that you need to read, uh -huh. but you have <laughs> no oxygen left to do so. Uh -huh. Sometimes I go out to dinner with a stack of papers and, uh -huh. and weed through them there. Um, do you rip stuff up so that you have... Um, that files, you, yes, so that do you do that. Have on, on particular subjects? I do have files, and the files become so unwieldy that then I have to weed the files. Um, some people are, are very married to paper. I'm kind of an old school person, and I still yeah. need to print things out. Other people have everything on their computer, and uh -huh. other people can fly blind on this and, uh -huh. and do just fine. Other people have to have a million files and and haul, you know, briefcases full of documents from country to country. <laughs> uh -huh. It's just a personal, a personal style. I, in terms of learning how to do this, I mean, it's no real. It's not really any different than covering the city council. In a local community, it, yeah, stakes are higher. The stakes are much higher. <laughs> but when you get to this point, you've already 
you're already at that point to be able to handle that. So, uh -huh. but it's it's just basic reporting. You you develop sources. You 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 know you find out what is coming and you you work on them and mm -hmm. you just have to keep at them because they're not going to just hand things to you. You have to be very persistent. Uh huh. Do you um do you come to White House reporting with a group of sources? that no. you're then able to use? Well, some people do if they've covered the campaign uh -huh. of the president who's coming into the office. Yes. How did you come? I came as an extra. Um, they had someone on the campaign trail in 2000. Uh, they took somebody from the White House beat out and put them on the campaign trail. And there was an opening at the White House. They needed somebody to fill in for a year. So I did the last year of Clinton. Uh -huh. And um, that was basically a... I always compare it to uh, holding on to a, the tail of a tiger because, yeah. one, you don't know what you're doing. Two, it's extremely fast-paced and crazy, and you basically just need to hang on and make it. Uh -huh. um, I, so I sort of knew how to do it then. I took a leave of absence for a little bit for other reasons and then came back uh, about a year later to the White House, to the... Uh, AP and uh -huh. and was at the bureau and there was a need for somebody at the White House and they pulled me back in and said, uh -huh. Deb knows how to do this, put her over there and on a temporary basis and then I sort of earned my wings uh -huh. from that point. Um, where did you work in Associated Press before you came to the White House the first time? Um, I started out, I grew up in Kansas City in St. Louis, I went to the University of Kansas Journalism School. I did many, many internships at different places, Danville, Illinois, Salina, Kansas, uh -huh. Kansas City Paper. I uh, did an internship with a group of weeklies in Minneapolis, Minnesota. All those were during Christmas breaks or during Summers. summer breaks. Uh -huh. Started um, full-time at a paper in Lafayette, Indiana, and worked there for, I think it was like four years. I, I did feature writing, and then I did the business beat uh -huh. and covered factories <coughs> like Caterpillar Tractor and Green Giant where they made pudding pops and frozen lasagna and uh -huh. things like that. And then from there, applied to the AP and ended up in Kansas City, which was perfect because I did know the area. And the Indianapolis bureau chief had moved to become the bureau chief in Kansas City and hired me into the AP mm -hmm. that way, worked there several years, and then became the uh, correspondent in Western Maryland, covering uh -huh. four counties for the AP for about eight years, helped raise a couple kids, and uh, then transferred down to the Washington Bureau, which would, was my aim all along, yeah. and became the education writer, and did that for a year or so, and then they started a team of, of writers, uh, feature writers, who were doing the side stories on all the big news in Washington, which was extremely, extremely fun job. We did what kinds of things. Like we would go over to the courthouse and do a story about Monica Lewinsky when it mm -hmm. wouldn't be the legal case; it would be the the fun side story about how many reporters were there and the scrum. Yeah, the scrum exactly. Yeah. And then I did a, a a big piece once on uh, at the anniversary of Roe versus Wade. I went and looked at all the papers at the uh, Library of Congress to kind of mm -hmm. uh, do a tick-tock on what was happening behind the scenes at the court during the time that they were putting that decision together, and that was a fun story to do, and many, many other stories that were sort of interesting. Uh -huh. And then they needed someone uh, to cover transportation, and I did that for almost a year when the Egyptian airliner crash occurred. And then they needed someone at the White House, and I started to fill in over there just on a brief brief uh, temporary basis. And then, uh -huh. as I said, sort of earned my yeah my yeah. wings. Have you ever done editing? Have you ever worked as an editor? Not <coughs> formally, no. Uh-huh. No, it's, um, I, I'm really more of a field person. Uh-huh. I, I see myself more as a reporter than an editor. Do you find that Although, when you get older, you... You start to wonder what you're going to do in the future. 
<laughs> Do you find that in doing all the different things that you've done, that um, there are more similarities or more differences in the way that you operated as a reporter getting information, both at the, at the uh, local level and um, also, say, even in, uh, in Western Maryland, which wasn't all that long ago, um, there have been enormous changes in the industry. Does what a reporter look for, has that remained fairly similar? It's just that the industry has changed and the tools you use might be different? I believe so. Uh-huh. I believe I do the same thing to, f to ferret out news the same way I've always done it. Uh -huh. Do your homework. Know the issue before you go in. Almost as if a lawyer knows the answers to the questions before they put someone on the stand. Mm -hmm. Do your homework. Go in. The sources will recognize that you're educated on the issue and will respect you and oftentimes try to help you because they want to. Mm -hmm. um, I think my success has come at times when I've been seen as a fair reporter. Washington can be extremely partisan and I decided long ago that the better approach would be down the middle mm -hmm. and if sources respect you because you're not partisan they tend to yeah. work with you mm -hmm. with little fear that you have an axe to grind, an agenda to report, whatever. Mm -hmm. And as long as you're fair and down the middle, I, I found success with that, with sources. Uh huh. Well, uh, and, and oftentimes it's it's a true bipartisanship thing. I, I'm not trying to say I'm uh -huh. different than the rest of the reporters, but I usually cannot make a, a personal decision about issues because mm -hmm. I see both sides. <laughs> and uh -huh. that has been my job for so long, to see both sides, that I now find myself personally unable to make personal decisions about candidates, issues, yeah. what have you. So I am truly down the middle on, on uh -huh. most things, and I think my sources yeah. realize that and, and do not fear me for that reason. Mm -hmm. What is, um, if you were to think, what is a White House story? What are the components of a story that you'd put together at the White House? What are the things that you look for? Like, say you're doing... Well, I think message is a big thing. <clears throat> you know, beyond, beyond what the president says on a daily basis, you really need to find out what he means. Uh -huh. And that's your job. How do you do that? Because you can transcribe words. Anybody can do that. I usually try to find out what he's going to say before he says it. Uh-huh. And then I'll hear it when he says it, uh -huh. and I'll know what the message is that he's trying to convey. And then, because I already know what the message is going to be, I will have already done my homework to find out what the other sides uh -huh. have said or read or done or said, you know. So you can have a balanced piece to begin with. Mm -hmm. That's a little challenging at the White House because they don't like to tell you at a time what's going on or they don't like to tell you what's going on at all. Uh -huh. So you sort of have to find out what what message he intends to convey on a given day and then you have to figure out why. And you have to do all that before he speaks. Uh -huh. And then you can have a decent piece. Uh, Otherwise you're, you're basically just reporting his words. And we do that too. Sometimes it, it, we report the words and then we figure out what yeah they mean or what his game plan is or what the White House message is or you know, their agenda is. You know, say at the end of the week on Fridays, they give the week ahead. So you know pretty much what speeches he's going to give the following week. Right. Although so you won't you know you like what sessions with uh, members of Congress who will come over like when the when FISA, uh, FISA bills are right. being discussed. Um, but you know from the Hill calendar what kinds of things are up and so what's going to be of interest to them. I write on my calendar everything that's going on that I can find. So what kinds of things would you put on your calendar? Uh, Rice testifies on the Hill. Um, FISA bill comes up. Um, FISA bill expires. Uh -huh. um, you know, Bush leaves for Africa. Um, 
Bush sees Ban Ki Moon from the UN, uh -huh. um, you know, Gates to testify on Afghanistan. Just so, because the White House is only one component of what's going on in Washington, you have to put build that into what's happening elsewhere. Maybe the UN is meeting. Maybe the EU is meeting. Maybe yeah. There is hot news coming out about a report on Iran or something, and you have to kind of build that into your thought process on a daily basis. How do you know all the different things that are going to be happening? I just spend a lot of time reading, and I, whenever I see a date mm -hmm. that seems important to me, I jot it down in my calendar. Uh -huh. So that when he, like Bush, when I find out that Bush is going to speak on a given subject, I go, oh, well, that's the reason why. He, it's because abroad they're doing this or they're doing uh -huh. that. or It just kind of helps you to kind of keep it Do you find rolling. that you can um, get information, that the White House is not giving you information, that uh, the Hill is an important source for you, and then in foreign, uh, in foreign governments, are they sometimes, like say on trips, mm -hmm. um, sometimes you can find out from a foreign government they will talk about when they're, um, when the president is coming or when their president is is going to the US right there's and a there's a big joke around the White House press corps as you know where we always say if there's an important announcement about foreign travel another country will announce it yeah because <laughs> the, we always find out from the other country before we find out from the White House that the president is going somewhere uh-huh but also we have you know we have sources in the travel um, advance teams who will tip us to what might be coming and it's basically for planning purposes we right. we know uh -huh. where he's going this year and we can uh -huh. start getting ready for that uh-huh it the public might not know but we do because it affects our lives and we're basically living his schedule so uh-huh you know it affects when i take my own personal vacations uh-huh and i guess it's a lot of resources um like uh say in the trip to africa what kinds of things how many people go uh, we say, always cover him in tandem. And, we um, always take two people on a trip. One's always with the president on Air Force One and moving in the pool from wherever he's going, from an AIDS clinic to a school to, we always have a reporter right with him. And then we have someone else who's in the filing center abroad mm -hmm. in contact with Washington. Mm -hmm. And then they often swap and one then goes on Air Force One in the pool and the other one goes into the filing center to write. So it's a constant leapfrog situation where we're moving uh -huh. with him throughout the trip, but it changes the person who's doing it. Uh -huh. Are there are there issues that um, that you specialize in that um, when they come up, they may not be issues like say the economy that's going right. to be um, that all of you all are going to be having to deal with, but are there some things? Like, for example, in presidential records, you know, we first met talking yeah. about presidential records. Um, and uh, I that, that has I, been a specialty of yours. I learned that because I covered a lot of the uh, Nixon, Nixon tapes that came out uh -huh. and uh -huh. Kennedy documents that came out to, uh, so many, many years ago. There were many document dumps, and I uh -huh. had a hand in that and became fascinated by that mm -hmm. subject. I would say probably they would come to me on something like that. Mm -hmm. But keep in mind, we have people all over Washington and all over the world who are experts on given subjects. Yeah. We have people who are experts on Gitmo. We have people who are experts on, you know, uh, missile defense. And all we need to do as White House reporters is tap our own people and say, because we can't be, we're, we're kind of a jack of all trades. We can't, right. but we can't be experts on every single subject that comes through the White House because everything comes through the White House. Yeah. And there's no way that mm. I could be uh, as informed as our intel reporter, for example, mm -hmm. on Al Qaeda. How would they be helpful? Would they, would you work together with them on a story? I do, yes. I, uh -huh. I reach out right away and, and make sure that they're their input is is being reflected in the report because there's no way that I could I could know everything so uh -huh. and we're only going to handle the issue maybe for one day and then put it down and then pick it up maybe three days later uh -huh. so we're constantly parachuting in and out of all these issues and you have to be very careful because you can get in trouble by what you don't know 
and have your, you find your greatest out. enemy is what yeah. you don't know and when you're writing you know ignorance is <laughs> how do you find out what you don't know I, I've just become good at um, knowing where the minefields are uh-huh you uh, if you I mean you don't assume you don't you double check facts you you have a pretty good idea of, of where you're going to get in trouble if you start into legal areas. Mm -hmm. You're just very careful, and when you need to vet something, you immediately send those paragraphs to the beat reporter mm -hmm. and ask them to check them for accuracy. Uh -huh. And often they'll tweak them, you know, slightly and move them right back to you, and then you'll uh -huh. incorporate them in your story and move on. But Can you have to know when to ask, uh -huh. and you get good at that. <clears throat> Um, can you walk us through a day and start out with um, what kinds of things you read at the, uh, at the beginning of the day? I wake or up at, um, you know, 7 o'clock and, and grab a cup of coffee and the newspapers, which are outside my door. Uh, first thing I do is I check my BlackBerry and make sure that news isn't breaking as I'm waking up. I mm -hmm. throw on CNN immediately, uh -huh. um, make sure that the world hasn't ended. <laughs> <laughs> while I've been sleeping and oftentimes you'll find a statement from the White House waiting for you when you're wake when you wake up and yeah you sometimes you have to immediately call in with what the White House is saying since there are four of us one person one of our staff might have already done it we just always have this mm -hmm. if, if somebody has handled it then we kind of have a system where we have told the rest of the group don't worry about it. Go get your coffee. I've already handled this. Uh huh. Um, and how do you tell I read them the that? paper. By, we email. By Blackberry. Everything's Blackberry. Yes. <clears throat> I mean, there are mornings when I've woken up and immediately thrown my laptop up and open on my bed and started uh -huh. working. And then other mornings when I can leisurely read the newspapers and. Which newspapers do you read? The New York Times and Washington Post every day, every morning. And uh -huh. if you don't have time to read all the stories, you you at least quickly run through it to see what's there and I live very close to the White House so I can run over early mm -hmm. late whatever but normally we don't have to be there until 930 which is great because mm -hmm. it gives you a couple hours in the morning to kind of get your bearings mm -hmm. and CNN kind of helps not I don't particularly um, favor CNN over any other network it's just that there are news all the time so and it's international as well as And domestic. it's international, and I can yeah. get a quick uh, download immediately while I'm, you know, doing my hair and my makeup and then run. Uh -huh. And it's a quick way of, it would be the same as me reading our own wire, but to do that uh -huh. I'd have to sit and do that. Whereas CNN, I can listen while I'm doing other things and run out. And uh -huh. then I run up to the White House and I'm there by the gaggle time, which is 9.30. And that's our first yeah. shot at the So what do, you, what do you learn from the gaggle? We get comment, immediate comment right up off the top on, you know, the subject of the day, whatever it might be. That's mm -hmm. our first shot at getting something formally on the, on the wire. Uh -huh. And then it's also kind of a, a, a good thing for them that they know then what's on our mind and they can then prepare for the briefing, which is midday. Do you find that um, that the responses that they give in the briefing are much more mature than what you get at the gaggle? Sometimes. Uh -huh. Was it, have there been differences in press secretaries, as far as you can remember, of people I mean, who are particularly people, good at that? Yeah, some of the press people are into detail and mm -hmm. and policy, and others are other spokespeople are more into the big picture and politics. So. Uh -huh. It depends on who you've got up there, basically. So you find out what's on, what's on their mind. Um, Mostly they find out what's on our uh, mind, I think. Uh -huh. I really think that's kind of <coughs> the way it is. They do do a little opening, but it's usually schedule and span. And yeah. Uh -huh. If they have something to say, obviously they'll say it. No. Uh -huh. Yeah, but mostly it's, um, I mean, it's become particularly increasingly um, now short. Yeah, they can be short, long. We kind of run the the length. I mean, the reporters can say, okay, we're done. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so you've gotten out. What 
uh, you've gotten a response, say, from what, whatever the issue is, if there's an issue that particular day. Like, say, um, <coughs> say the House is going to um, uh, vote on... Uh, Given bill, yeah. yeah. Well, we've got someone in the booth then. Mm -hmm. Remember, there are four of us. One person is sitting there in the briefing, and the other person is listening to the briefing. So the person who is listening to the briefing is already filing what the White House then is saying on, you know, Bill A going through the House or uh -huh. whatever. And that is already on the wire before the person actually comes back from the briefing. Uh -huh. it's, a, it's a team situation. It, yeah. It's a constant rolling team situation. Then, at, well, let's say you were, um, you were in the AP seat in the, uh, in the briefing room. So you come back, and then what are you going to add to that story? Is that going to be your story? Oh, not always. Uh -huh. no. I mean, there's probably there, oftentimes there's a story on the wire already on the wire, uh -huh. because the Hill has written that the House uh -huh. is going to take up right, sure. said bill, yeah. And we're just inserting a, a paragraph in there saying, by the way, the White House is saying blah 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 on yeah. Bill A. So what do you do from take there? Take that for whatever it's worth. I mean, a lot of times it's not worth putting in. A lot of times. Um, I mean, sometimes it's just not worth using. You know, we don't just put it out because we put it out. It has to be, it has to move the story forward. Mm -hmm. um, in looking at the... Uh, so it, the gag was a lot of feeding. Uh, uh -huh. The gag was a lot of feeding. On a typical day, we're feeding into stories that are either on the wire already or to uh, bureaus abroad that are going to need the information later. Uh, very rarely do they break news at the gaggle. And when they do, we'll move out an urgent series in a separate, uh -huh. again, before the person ever comes back from the briefing, it'll be on the wire. What difference does it make to you who's press secretary? The press secretary does the gaggle and then also the, um, the briefing at 1230. And then, of course, you talk during the day. But does it make a difference to you who the press secretary is? And I've, only dealt with, I've only dealt with four thus far, and the ones that I tend to relate to best are the ones who are more uh, into the details. Mm -hmm. um, we're seeking information from the White House through these people, and if they're not going to give us, you know, information, then uh -huh. it's only going to be what we call White House spin. Mm -hmm rhetoric, quotes, and that's not as useful. We're trying to find right. out what's happening, what the White House actually thinks about given issues, not what the message is. Mm -hmm. We're not interested in the message as much as we're interested in information. And so those press secretaries who are more steeped in the actual nitty-gritty of mm -hmm. policy are more beneficial or more valuable to me uh -huh. in the way I go about my reporting. Other people would probably say something else sometimes. Uh, if I mean, sometimes you're looking for a really great quote. Uh -huh. You're not going to get it from somebody who is a policy wonk. So yeah. uh, if you're looking for information or you're looking for a quote, you know, it depends on what your story needs. You, know, uh -huh. you might be more inclined to be to favor one or the other. Uh -huh. Some are better at the spin. Some are better at the policy. And then, if, if some are better at the quips. Some are better at the, you know, yeah, slamming Congress, you know, or whatever. Yeah, combat. Yeah, yeah. some are better at the <clears throat> at TV. Others aren't. It. But I find the ones from a wire perspective, the ones that are more most beneficial to me are the ones who actually uh, have availed themselves of the details of a given subject and. Mm -hmm. And you can ferret that out from them and, and actually get guidance on what's happening. That's where the news is. Uh -huh. And sometimes if the uh, press secretary doesn't do that, there may be deputies. Yeah, there's, yeah, there's plenty uh, of deputies who, around. who you can Or tap. deputies in other White House offices. Right, and like, you do that. You then figure out which ones know about which subjects uh -huh. and you go after them. What do you do for the morning after the, uh, after the gaggle and you've gotten that down? Oh, you take a big breath and you say, okay, what, what do we got today? Who's doing what? Mm -hmm. Maybe he's on a trip and we've already got somebody in his Air Force base ready to take off. And then it's a matter of going out on the South Lawn and saying goodbye. Uh -huh. See you, President. Uh -huh. He Sometimes he'll make a statement on the South Lawn. Most of the time he doesn't say a word. So 
it's just a matter of walking outside, seeing him take off and walking back in the White House and then maybe spending the day on something that you're trying to work on. Uh -huh. Until then, he speaks in Kansas City or wherever he's flown to, and then we're any words that the president says anywhere in the world are piped into our booth, and then the people in the booth are helping the person on the ground take the notes, mm -hmm. get the news out, and uh, so you work that for maybe half an hour to an hour, and then he's maybe off on the plane again to some other place, and you've got time then to make phone calls and do whatever you want to do. Mm -hmm. Grab lunch, you know, <clears throat> talk to people at the White House who are not on the trip, uh -huh. uh, plan your week, contact people around Washington who know what's going on at the White House who can share that with you. Uh huh. And uh, one of the, the um, time is our enemy with uh -huh. the wire. Because we, we have to cover him so closely that time is our, our major enemy. How do, you, um, how do you both cover him? and cover the presidency. Because there's sometimes when there are things in covering a White House is different than covering him. And so there can be things that can be happening within the White House that are, uh, are interesting, that are separate from him. And I think how do you goes, decide when, you, when those kinds of things need to be done? You kind of always know what the big issues are that they're wrestling with, you know, and you then seek out the deputies. Mm -hmm. because they are in the nitty-gritty of those issues and you try to figure out what the next uh, news peg is going to be on that subject mm -hmm. maybe f on uh, maybe on the on the FISA story maybe the White House consul is going to be writing a letter to the Hill right. maybe you can yeah. get a jump on that if you know it's coming uh -huh. um, maybe the president is planning a speech in somewhere three weeks from now on a, a given subject and then you find out that he's going to do that and then you kind of try to find out what he's going to say mm -hmm. ahead of time. The whole idea is to get this stuff ahead of time before anybody else does. Uh -huh. And it's highly competitive because yeah. the top people at all the networks yeah. are at the White House and they're fighting for their lives as well as we are. Yeah. Um, so are there um, are there kind of uh, areas that um, that you see as important issues that relate to a White House, but that um, may not be there not, may not be one particular thing that um, that sets something off in your mind, but you think well. I mean, I think like, we've say, talked about some of these. You know, yeah. I mean, the Presidential Records Act. Right. You know how they the email situation. Are they mm -hmm. capturing the email? Are they losing the email? Yeah. These kind of issues, just issues of presidential powers, for example. Yeah, right. Executive privilege, the the state secrets, the um, just the whole idea of of uh, transparency. Mm -hmm. uh, of the presidency of the White House, all those issues can move from one presidency to the next, and they remain. Uh -huh. uh, relations with the Hill, you know, uh -huh. um, there's always a, a seesaw of of power that goes from one branch of government to the another to another at, throughout history. So mm -hmm. somebody needs to be tracking that as it moves uh -huh. from one to the next. Mm -hmm. You know, kind of the way we change from the pendulum and, a, and the political pendulum swings from, you know, Democrat to Republican in the country. The power, the executive privilege of the White House will wane and gain mm -hmm. over different periods in history. And I think our jobs are really to track that as well. Uh -huh. There's not a whole lot of readership for that, though. Uh -huh. And so when you market those stories, there's n very few editors who are interested in those. Because it's a big subject. It's more of a watchdog role kind of thing. Uh -huh. And there's not a whole lot of readers out there who want to slog through a story about what difference does the it power make? of the presidency. What difference does it make how many papers take your stories? It doesn't, but you have to weigh that with, you have to weigh that against the news that you have to cover. Yeah. You have to weigh that against what your editors want you to write. You know, a lot of times, if you really want to get into something like that, you almost have to do it on your own time. Uh -huh. 
because they're not willing to give you the time to do something that's not going to be of high readership. Uh -huh. Although I do think those kind of issues are important. What um, difference has the um, Internet made? Because it, it seems that it, uh, um, AP has benefited from, uh, from the, the Internet in a way that um, a lot of news organizations like newspapers haven't. But um, it seems like AP has because it's, it's used by a lot of, of, um, of Internet sites. Right. Well, I think there, you know, our AP is cooperative. We're not a for-profit corporation. So we're um, serving our members, and the membership uh -huh. demographics have changed greatly. Uh -huh. Our main, um, pretty soon our main members are not going to be the newspapers. They're going to be, you know, it's going to be the Internet, and probably already is. I don't have the uh -huh. just statistics on it, although my bureau chief could rattle them off uh -huh. quickly. Uh -huh. Yahoo, AOL, AOL whatever. <coughs> We can see our stories on posted immediately on those sites, uh -huh. and the newspaper. The amount of newspapers that are taking our service <coughs> has remained constant, but <coughs> it's being overtaken by the fast mover, mo the faster moving media. Yeah. So, our clients have sort of changed. Uh huh. Has that made a difference to your reporting? I think it has made a lot of difference in terms of the urgency of our reporting. I think I think years ago it was a competitive issue. There were more wire services. We were always trying to be first. I think after UPI's demise, I think we became much more um, newspaper-based. Uh, mm -hmm. I think now we're moving back into the high-speed, high, mm -hmm. high-moving uh, news alert, quick, you know, urgent series. Mm -hmm. There's a lot more attention right now to timeouts. Mm -hmm. Who's winning the the race, basically? Uh huh. Who are you in the race with? We're in the race with a lot of people. We're in the race with Reuters, uh huh. And we're in the race with um, some, a Bloomberg and other news organizations, other wires. We're also in the race with uh, the New York Times website and uh -huh. the uh, Washington Post website and right. LA Times and uh -huh. websites. Uh, the newspapers are. Uh, are posting their their stories uh, more quickly and and we better have the story on the wire before that happens because otherwise we'll hear it. Uh huh. So who do you so hear, we'll it hear it from? We'll hear it from our bureau chief. Uh huh. They check the timeouts on stories. Uh, how many minutes you're ahead? Uh huh. Uh, in telling the news. How many seconds you're ahead? We're even getting down to the point now where we're gonna. We used to. I've just heard this recently that. We used to just track it by minute, but now we're actually going to track it by seconds. <laughs> so I guess we have a, I guess we're going to have a leg up in terms of uh, if we win by 30 seconds. Is that a good thing? <laughs> Whatever. That's our job. You know, I mean, our job is to get it out first. And yeah, but at the same time, it has to be accurate. Right. That that is the challenge. That is the challenge. Um. You have to be fast. But more importantly, you must be accurate. Yeah. And sometimes those two things uh, do not go hand in hand. <laughs> <laughs> so let's go to some questions. Do you all have some questions? <coughs> oh, they're all just board steps. Yeah, they're moving out. Mm -hmm. The professor is in there. He's just moving <coughs> from the road. And so he's going to call on because otherwise it's. Uh, oh. yeah, to to <coughs> Just speak. Um, who releases the paper when the new race today? And is the AP usually the first to report on breaking news? The AP is not always the first to, to report on breaking news, but that's our uh, our charge. Uh, CNN can beat us. Um, Reuters can beat us. BBC can beat us. New York Times can be, you know, it's it's a it's a competitive race out there. It's whoever can put it out first and fastest. It's I, I mean the chase is the the chase is the fun of the business, obviously, but it's also something that gives you major headaches and major ups and downs when you win or lose the race, and uh, can be really hard on you personally. 
that um, when you're not first, you hear about it, who, or people. Uh huh. You know that they we all want to be first, so you know we're not going to be first every time, and our editors know that. But it's a disappointing day when we're not. When we get beat, we all hang our heads and <laughs> feel bad, and <laughs> and then we go on to the next story because there's always another one to chase. Uh -huh. <laughs> and if we get beat, we're, you know, we usually are, come out fighting uh -huh. to get the next one. Do you, do you ever find um, sympathetic people in, uh, in government who um, uh, know you've gotten beaten on something and they give you something? Yeah, they, they do. Uh -huh. They do fair. They do, uh, they do hand out, um, you know, beats on, uh, to different reporters at different times. You know, it's kind of their way of managing the press corps. Do, do you find that um, sometimes one of the, I'm, I'm doing this actually uh, based on, on uh, uh, two administrations having done this, <laughs> that uh, they've given out stories that, uh, that they know are stories that are, that are uh, ones that are not going to reflect well on them, but they know they have to give it out. Because I call it, we call that taking out the trash. Ah. Yes. <laughs> and, um, they do it on Friday afternoon a lot. Uh huh. But yeah. sometimes, and like. Sometimes, like uh, on New Year's Eve, they like to do that too. Um, they, um, let's say that um, uh, they're worried about what a newspaper is going to do with it. And so they they'll decide that uh, what they'll do is they'll give it to AP. Yeah, they call that the pre buttle. They, we call that the pre buttle. Uh huh. And um, it's rebutting a story that they know is going to come out uh -huh. in hopes of massaging the. Yeah, and if they give it to you, and then uh, you all, I'm not just saying to you individually, but mm -hmm. let's say it gives it to AP. Right. Uh, and then they figure they'll give you the facts, and they know that you all are interested in facts and laying stuff out and not doing a lot of the judgment. I mean, you have. Right. You have many, you know, your stories are going to be shorter right. than something in the Washington Post. And so... I haven't seen a whole lot of that. <coughs> I, I think it happens, but I don't, I don't see a whole lot of that. Do you? Um, no, I know they've done it. Oh, yeah, I know they've done it. Uh, and, and I've probably been in the, the recipient Clinton, of it see, over the, the time. administration... Clinton was really big on controlled leaks. Uh-huh, yeah, because... They, it would be uh, as if they were managing the press through leaking. Uh-huh. And, and they would choose given reporter to do given story. Yeah. Well, and if in particular, if like say, if they were doing um, a story that dealt with technology, they might have, uh, in the Clinton years, they would have given that to USA Today. Exactly. Yeah. Right, they do Because they know the audience. Right, but that's more controlling yeah. the message more than it is. Right. But no, I was thinking of... Um, Say giving a story that you that you think that uh, it's gonna be bad that news. the Washington Post or the New York Times is going to beat you over the head with it. So give it to AP, and then it's going to run in the Washington Post and the New York Times, and maybe they then will just say, okay, it's already run on AP, no. and we're not going to do. Um, well, the newspaper wouldn't say that. Um, uh, the newspaper wouldn't say that. They would do their own story. Uh -huh. We're all very turf conscious. <laughs> uh huh. They wouldn't just take that and go with it. They would still do their own story. If it's not a real big thing, it's something that might cause them some anguish, the White House some anguish. Yeah. And so they might release it that way. Um, <clears throat> it's just all just so different on every story. I mean, there's the, the administration. It's funny because the administration has gotten better at this game uh -huh. as it has moved forward, I think. And they've brought in different communications people. And uh -huh. you can see it happening, how they've, you know, they'll leak a certain story to a certain news organization for given reasons. And it's funny to watch because they've gotten better at this over the years. Um, I was joking around with one of the communications people one time in one of the um, events one day, and I said, oh, I said, oh, well, you're going to, you're going to, uh, I'm going to read about this on the USA Today tomorrow, aren't I? And, and uh, he said, how did you know? And I said, I don't know, I just figured that's what you guys would do. And he's uh -huh. like, how did you know? I'm like, I don't know. I just guessed. He said, yeah, that's what we're going to do. I'm like, yeah. so uh, then, of course, I told my boss that we were going to get beat by USA Today the next day on, on whatever it was. And uh, uh -huh. 
You know, one of the things, I, I know the Clinton people did, I don't know if the uh, Bush people do, but uh, say they're going to give something, uh, they've got a story and, you know, and it's, they of course want it to be, to be on the front page and um, uh, better <coughs> yet, above the fold. And so they can give it to the USA Today. If they give it to USA Today on a Friday, you know, for a Friday paper, the advantage of that is that that paper is in the box all weekend. And so people walking by it see it. Yep, the White House does think about these things. Yeah. Does this White House, I know the Clinton White House did that. Does yeah, this no, they do, do too. too. And th it's, it's a matter of news cycles with them. I think that they sometimes give out things ahead because they'll gain an extra news cycle on it. Right. Yeah. Instead of having two, they'll get three. Three. Right. Yeah. 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 As, you know, evening, morning. Right. Evening. Yeah. Because it's, um, it's hard to make a story keep going when you've got right. fast pace and people have heard about it. Exactly. Yeah. You know, they don't, you, so you've got to add something new. Right. Sort of in each time. Another question? Um, you were talking about the importance of figuring out what the president's message is and just instead of reporting his own words, trying to figure out what he's trying to say before he even says it. Do you think, do you find it difficult or do you see an issue with other journalists um, being bipartisan and mean staying objective when doing this? You know, like instead of taking their own spin on what the president says and simply reporting the facts? I think some reporters are better than others. Um, some reporters do have an agenda to uh, to to, uh, to mm -hmm. work, I think. I mean, some people are down the middle and some people aren't. I mean, there's a, there's, I think you can tell which ones are, uh, are, you know, have their own ideas and are wanting to put their own ideas into their reporting. Um, Would I'm that not sure I'm going to answer your question. Is that mostly be people, well, columnists, um, or people that are writing news analysis? Are there reporters, like, like say, people who occupy the first three rows <laughs> in the briefing? Would you find... Most of those people are pretty down the middle. Yeah. But don't forget, they're responding to editors who uh -huh. may not be as down the middle uh -huh. as they are. Uh -huh. And, you know, you have to... Sometimes yeah. editors have their own idea about what... Uh -huh the story should be before <coughs> anybody finds out what the story is. And it's hard to move them then off the mark. Yeah, so it's not just the reporters. And sometimes the story's already being fashioned on the editing before it's reported and then you end up with the problem of having to pull it back. Uh -huh. And the reporter doesn't have as much power as some of the editors do. Uh -huh. And it's difficult sometimes to pull that back. I'm not sure I've answered your question. Good. Yeah, thank you. Another one? We've got lots more. Uh, have you ever been intimidated by anyone for reporting on a story a certain way? Yeah. I think, you know, the White House will call you if they don't like a verb. <laughs> uh, <laughs> You know, they'll pick up the phone and they'll email you and they'll go. I think I used the word, last week I used the word rubber stamp. And uh, somebody in the press, press operation with the White House didn't, uh, didn't think that was a very good word. <laughs> and um, What will they do? Do they, do they pick up the phone or do they... They'll uh, email you or pick email up the phone you. either way. Uh-huh. They're not shy about expressing their feelings about your, your work. Uh, you, have to, you have to decide whether you're accurate or if you've somehow missed the mark and you need to change it in some way. Now, when that um, in happened, that particular case, yeah. um, I had picked up that word from our Hill people um, in their writing about the intelligence bill. Uh -huh. And I had said something like, you know, that the president wants, wants Congress to rubber stamp the Senate version. And basically that's what he wants. But uh -huh. There are differences in the bills, and yes, of course, they're all going to reconcile it, and yes, of course, there is going to be some give and take probably on different issues that are not even in the press. So, you know, I caved in that case, and on the next right through, I, I said reconcile or something instead of rec uh, rubber stamp. 
But I mean, you can see the detail in which that they that they the, follow that they follow. You know, now there's some cases they'll call up and they'll say, "I can't believe you all wrote this. This is wrong. This is not right." And we're like, "No, that's exactly what the president said. We're not changing a word. That's it." You know. Uh huh. And then other times they'll come back and say, "We think you guys have, you know, have uh, have taken the wrong tact on this story. You know, you, you don't you don't you're not saying what the president is saying." And and then, you know, we'll say yes, but you're not taking into consideration the fact that the administration for the past, you know, five years has been doing this, that, and the other. And then they'll go, okay, well, you know. Uh-huh. And sometimes they slink away, and sometimes <clears throat> they fight until the end, and sometimes we change, and sometimes we don't. It just depends on what the issue is. You don't change because the White House wants you to. You only change because it's journalistically right to do so. And you know that. I mean, it becomes very clear to you. Uh -huh. If you've made a mistake, for example, you know, I'll be the first one to fix that. If I've said something that's inaccurate, I'll be the first one to run out on the wire and say, you know, corrects fifth graph, you know, whatever. Uh -huh. So, Did they but if it's, a if it's a matter of spin or message, then uh -huh. you can't be manipulated by them because they have an agenda but the agenda is not always what's, uh -huh. what is real. Uh, do they ever work their way up the, um, uh, the kind of the, the AP White House uh, oh, yeah. food chain? Oh, they've gone so beyond the AP White House. <laughs> they've gone all the way to uh, the bureau and the news editor and the bureau chief and, oh, yeah. And what happens when they do not that? Not a whole lot. Uh-huh. Not a whole lot. Our, our bureau chief... Um, you know, we'll then call us and say, what's going on over there, you know? <laughs> uh -huh. You know, we've had some fights with the White House on, on given subjects, and uh, we have some reporters that the White House, you know, is not really excited about. Mm -hmm. People that are not in the booth, mm -hmm. but people who cover other subjects around town, and they're not shy about uh -huh. nailing and slamming and criticizing them on a on a regular basis, and you know, again, we have to look and say, well, is this, an, is this a, a reasonable criticism, or are they just upset because of what the news is or what the issue is? And you just have to weigh all that. Have you ever had the, the president um, say something that uh, was, um, uh, was critical in any way to you? Oh, he's pointed his finger at me many times and said, let me finish, because I tend to interrupt him. Because <laughs> he, he'll go on, he'll, he'll start answering the question with the talking points, and we have no time for that. <laughs> and I want him to get on with it and answer what I've asked. And I can be very impatient, and so he has sensed this. <laughs> I think he can be fairly impatient himself. Yeah. And he's shook, he's shook his finger at me many, many times and said, let me finish. Actually, the, what, the day, uh, I always tell this story about how the day that that he said, bring him on, yes. that was actually my question. Uh -huh. And he shook his finger at me and said, let me finish. And then he went off and uh -huh. got himself in all kinds of trouble. Right, he would have been better <laughs> would, off. He would have been better off not saying a word, but he then went off. And then there were people later who said that I had made him mad, and I was responsible for that. <laughs> I said, I don't think so, you know? Yeah. The question was, in case anybody cares, uh -huh. was there were some, there were a lot of small countries that have joined the coalition in Iraq. And my question was, when are you going to get the big hitters? Uh -huh. When are you going to get the big guys who have the military might to help us out, right? Uh huh. And that then morphed into, you know, uh -huh. don't challenge us on the ground and, you know, bring them on and yeah yeah which they all talk about right it's yeah. a mistake he talks about it as a mistake yeah too. right but he shook <clears> his <throat> finger at me that day and, and then uh -huh. went off so he must have been mad about something else it wasn't me um you uh ap has a special role as reuters does uh too in <coughs> posing questions to a president that uh, one of the things that's happened in uh, recent years is, um, I mean, you can actually go back to Eisenhower and see that once 
uh, press conferences go on the record that um, presidents have given fewer press conferences and on a less regular basis. And what they have done increasingly in uh, recent years is to have short question and answer sessions. Two and, and two. And that would be, you know, the, the two and two. Yes. Uh -huh. well, no, not, not those. Um, uh -huh. But I'm thinking of, say, in the uh, Oval Office, a um, uh, foreign head of state comes and uh, they're in the chairs by the uh, fireplace in the Oval Office and reporters are brought in and he'll take two questions. Um, and so usually what happens is uh, you they all go to the get wires, one. Yeah. That's right, the wires get them. So how do you prepare your questions there and then how do you prepare your questions in a press conference? Much the same way because we often are first and we have an obligation to ask the question that is the news of the day. Uh -huh. uh, you know, the, you'll never find the wire standing up and saying, Mr. President, how do you feel about, you know, your last eight months in office? You know, I mean, uh -huh. they'll ask, right. the, the first question will always be something that's happening in the news. Yeah. And our members depend on that. That's why the AP gets, or the, or the other wires get the questions, is because our members are the newspapers. Our members are the broadcast stations in the country. Mm -hmm. We feed them mm -hmm. as a, almost as if it were a cable service. Mm -hmm. We feed them and so our obligation is to ask mm -hmm. the question that is of imminent importance of the given day. So we don't have the luxury of asking what say maybe a Time Magazine reporter would ask about you know how he feels about his daughter getting married or whatever you know. Mm -hmm. So the way we decide what that question is, it, it's usually pretty apparent. It's usually two or three different issues. And then it's a matter of figuring out how do you frame it in a way that will generate news and not just put him into his talking points uh -huh. on whatever subject it is. <clears throat> there are a couple different ways you can do that. Sometimes we collude with the other wire service and mm -hmm. say we're going to hit him up double barrel. Uh -huh. We're going to say, we're going to ask the question about Iran, and we know that we're going to get the talking points, but then Reuters, if you ask the same question, mm -hmm. he can't do the same answer. Uh -huh. So we might get more news then. Uh -huh. And so together, we'll get something. Uh -huh. Sometimes it's a collusion. Uh -huh. Sometimes the TVs are hot to trot about a subject they have to have, and they'll be pushing us hard to ask about you know, a different question. I remember asking a question once in one of these circumstances, situations and a TV reporter, TV reporter who was going to go on the air that night on another subject and wanted the tape of the president answering the question was just furious at me because I didn't ask what he wanted me to ask. Uh -huh. And I was furious back saying I don't service one person. <laughs> yeah. We service everyone and we think the most important question of the day was this. And that's a judgment call, and sometimes people get mad at us, and sometimes they don't. How do you, um, how many people are going to think through what you're going to ask? Um, two or three. Uh huh. It's usually the White House team, and then sometimes the bureau chief. Uh huh. Uh, depending on whether she's engaged in that in the given day, uh, the news conferences are a little bit more important. More people are brought into that. Uh huh. Um, are our White House correspondent, Terry Hunt, is the person who always goes into the news conference. He's the, he's the person who always asks the first question mm -hmm. of the president. He's my boss, and uh, he'll ask the rest of us what we think the questions are, and we'll feed him questions, and then in the end, he'll decide uh, with the Bureau what, what that's going to be. I've been in situations on the ranch, for example, out in the middle of nowhere, where we've all decided on the question, and then, boom, the bureau chief will call like two seconds before I'm supposed to ask it and change it completely and throws us for a loop because, you know, we're used to asking the questions, but we do have to kind of practice a little bit, uh -huh. you know, and get ready for what we're going to say. So, you know, sometimes you sort of practice your question and then all uh -huh. of a sudden we scrap it and we move to a different subject and if there so are you have to be ready to do that like really quickly if that happens. If there are a couple of you, will you go through like... Um, You'll say, okay, this is what I'm going to ask, and then this is what he's going to say. Yeah, we do that a lot. 
<clears throat> and then I should or come back another with reporter this, will or, say, well, if you ask that, he's just going to say that. So why don't you ask it this way? And then you go, oh yeah, that might work better. Okay, what do you guys think? Well, I don't know. I don't know. What do you think? Okay, well, how do we frame it like this? And oftentimes it's a real team effort. Uh huh. Um, some reporters won't do that. They'll just go in there and they'll do their own question, and that's it. Uh huh. I think the wire people have an obligation to be a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, at least I am. I. I I tend to ask the rest of the reporters, seeing that, yeah. that APs might get the only question or might get only one of two questions and that they're not going to get an opportunity to ask, I think the AP then has an obligation to find out what everybody else wants to. Yeah. And then incorporate that thought into what we're going to do to begin, you know. But uh -huh. that's just my approach. Uh huh. I think, you know, five minds are better than one. Uh huh. And then sometimes they, you know, sometimes they have ideas that I think are stupid. Mm -hmm. And then I go on and do what I'm going to do anyway. Mm -hmm. But oftentimes they have a, a point, you know. Well, I think that's a stupid question. Or why don't you ask it this way or that way or... Yeah. Okay. Question? Uh, with Bush White House renowned for its secrecy, does that make it harder to find sources and information outside of the formal press briefings? Yes, absolutely. I think sometimes the best way to cover the White House is from the outside. You find the people who are in touch with the White House staff at the staff level who are talking to these people, emailing these people on a daily basis, and then you find out what they are doing, and then you go to ask after you already almost know. I think the best way to find out what's going on inside the White House is outside the White House. A lot of times, you can cover issues that way from the outside and then move it in. You have to have sources on the outside. There's no way you can just cover the White House if you only talk to White House people. <coughs> Did those people tend that you go to tend to be people that you knew before you came on the beat, or sources that mostly you developed people I've them? developed. Uh huh. You know, I, I kind of have a rolodex and I go to them and say, "What are you hearing? You know, what do you think they might do?" What do you think they're doing? What have you heard they're doing? What's in it for them to talk to you outside the White House, particularly if the White House is not speaking? Well, then. they're careful. I mean, they don't want to wreck their own uh -huh. uh, pipeline to information. Right. So why? And that's why they talk, they talk off the record usually. Yeah, but why would they talk to you? Are they? Are uh, they? They they would trust you. They they know that you're not going to blow it. Um, they want to be helpful. Uh -huh. Sources want to be helpful. Uh -huh. It's funny. They want to be the know-alls. You know, the, they want to be the person seen as knowing something. Knowing, some people just can't wait to tell you. You know, uh -huh. some people just email you without even asking and say, "God, did you hear what I heard?" You know, you might want to know this. And uh -huh. other people, you know, you'll call them up and they'll be real squirrely for like the first 20 minutes, and then finally they'll go, "Well, you know, I did hear this," and they go, "Really?" Uh huh. <laughs> It just depends on who they are and how to play them. You, you, you get good at that. Uh huh. Do they have in common some kind of thought of information about what sorts of information should be, um, should be available to the public? You know, where does the public come in to as far as, um, well, let's say from you. Well, from well I think that's our role. I mean, uh -huh. I think we, we have to say to the sources, be, a, be them inside the White House or outside the White House, Look, you know, it really is important for the people to know this, don't you think? Uh -huh. You know, and why shouldn't the people know this? And, you know, I don't think you're telling me anything that the public shouldn't know, do you? Or, you know, uh -huh. you play into their, you know, their own uh -huh. citizenship what, or whatever. What democracy you know? is about. Exactly, yeah. whatever. You know, you play whatever you can play. Uh -huh. You know, this is this is a game. It's It's a big game, and you just... You, you move it forward the way you best can move it forward. I mean, but you find that there are people who really believe that. Yeah, oh yeah, that, absolutely. That um, there are people who call me and say, "You have to write about this because this is really bad." Uh huh. You know, <clears throat> why aren't you guys writing about this? Or mm -hmm. why did you guys write about this? <laughs> or yeah, you get it from all sides all the time. So it's. Do you find that this White House has changed as far as, say, in its secrecy? 
and the way that it's uh, it's I don't think it likes that tag. Uh -huh. And so I think it tries really hard not to have that tag. But, I mean, you're always going to have Cheney, and you're always going to have people who, the, the, you know, that the idea is we know what we're doing and we don't have to tell you. So as long as that philosophy is, is mm -hmm. you know, it, is around the White House, you're never going to have a transparent situation. But I'm not so sure that the that the Democratic, um, you know, administrations in the past haven't been just as bad on some issues. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I don't have anything right off the top of my head, but I would bet if you go back, there are probably are several Democratic and yeah well, administrations I mean, who've been pretty secretive about things. Yeah, and it, but if you if you look at what kinds of information come out. Uh, and the degree to which a president is on the record. The president is on the record now much more than he ever was. True. In the old days, you know, when they right. had press conferences that were off the record. Right. I mean, he just controlled that information. He'd say, well, you know, I'll talk to you about it, but you can't use it. Right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck on that today. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you just have, I mean, in some ways you have more contention because more is expected to be on the record. Look at the Congress. You know, at one time, Congress could have closed markup sessions. Right. It didn't have, uh, you know, the committee votes wouldn't be known. And so in all the institutions since the 1970s, you've had, since the 1960s with the Freedom of Information Act, all over the government, there's just more of a public perception. We have the right to this information, and why are you not providing it to us? Right. And you all, as surrogates for the public, are demanding that information, and uh, and they don't like that. I have a question for these people. How many people want to be reporters? How many of you all want to be reporters? Raise your hand. Nobody? Oh, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> There's okay. two on the sides you can't see. Okay, so we have a total of three okay. people who want to be a reporter. What do the rest of you want to do? Hello. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Go, down Go down the rows. Front row. What do you all want to do? Lobby. Okay. Next. Boston. Okay. Work for the U.S. What? Sorry. <laughs> Work for the U.S. Work for the U.N.? Oh, that sounds like a cool uh -huh. job. Okay. How many people want to go to law school? Anybody want to go into journalism? <laughs> <laughs> okay, <see. laughs> oh, a couple, okay. Broadcast or print? Broadcast. Broadcast, okay. Print. Print? Who's the print person? Who's the lone print person? I'm off camera. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Um, how many people want to be teachers? Okay. <laughs> See, there are more reporters than teachers. <laughs> I guess that's a good thing. <laughs> One more question. Well, you know, Anybody? as a reporter, you can be sued, so make friends with all the people who want to be lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a good point. Another question? Oh, two. Okay. The um, reporter. The reporter in the front. <laughs> A competition between um, the reporters. Is there any way certain reporters can, if you'll excuse the sports reference, but box out other reporters? And oh, yeah. If there are those ways, do they actually use them, or is it just whoever gets there first gets the story and gets the win? What do you mean, box out? I, like, I guess beat them to the punch or prevent them from releasing the story the way they want to mean, or at the time they want to? You mean like, like not play fair? I guess so. I mean, there's, there are plenty of instances where people have, uh, you know, broken phones so that other people can't use them. Or I heard a story recently about somebody who threw an AP banner or, or a sticker on phones in a filing center as soon as they got to the filing center so that other people didn't think they could use those phones. <laughs> you know, there are little games like that are being played, but... Well, there's, there's you know, one uh, in, in a very big story, and uh, that was Kennedy's assassination. Yeah, right. And uh, on, on that story... The UPI guy... 
<laughs> out, out Fox, the Associated right. Press correspondent. The Associated, this was a, a car. They were in a car. They were um, riding behind Kennedy and a few car lengths back. And um, uh, Merriman Smith was the United Press International correspondent. And he had been at the White House since the Roosevelt administration. And the reporter who was the AP reporter came in that particular day from the Hill. It was Jack Bell. And he came in from the Hill. He wasn't a White House correspondent. And one of the things that Merriman Smith used to do is uh, they had to rotate the seats in, uh, when, in that limousine. But he would come in and he would just simply sit down in the best seat. And so that day he sat down in the best seat, which was right by the phone. And he used to practice on uh, practice shooting a gun on the, uh, with the Secret Service. So he knew a lot about guns. And so when he heard, he heard shots. And he knew that it was not the backfire of a car. He knew, he knew that it was uh, gunfire. So he picked up the phone. And, uh, and so he called, I think he called the Dallas, uh, the Dallas Bureau. And, uh, and so he wouldn't let Jack Bell have the phone. And so Jack Bell was not, um, <laughs> was not accustomed enough to being there to know what his rights were and what they weren't. And of course, Merriman Smith knew that. And so he kept that phone. He wouldn't let Jack Bell have the phone yeah. until they got to the hospital. And then when he got to the hospital, he went to the Secret Service agent who was in the car. And so he talked to him, and he asked him what the situation was, and he said, the president is dead. And, but Smith wanted to, would not take it as fact, um, even though he described what the wound was, which had to be a fatal wound. Uh, so what he then did was say that a report that the Secret Service men said that the president was dead and then went to nail down the story. And then he saw that, that part of the, the group was moving out of the hospital once the president was dead. What he knew was that you move with the president. And so he knew if the president was dead, then what he needed to do was he needed to move with Lyndon Johnson. Because Lyndon Johnson was in Texas and was in, uh, was in Dallas at that time. So then he moved with him, and, be and Jack Bell was left in a phone booth reporting back <laughs> to, to uh, AP on, on what already had moved on the wire. And he missed the plane back to Washington. And so Merriman Smith was on the plane where Kennedy was, where Kennedy took the oath of office. So, yeah, so being, <laughs> knowing where to be in the right place or... Uh... Yeah. Half of it. <laughs> and you do learn that kind of stuff, you know, by just being in the motorcades and stuff. You know where to be and what you can see them moving, and it's an uh, unusual movement or people running or, you know, schedule changes or, you know, something that will tip you to, oh my God, there's something going on that makes you then start emailing, calling, what's going on, find out. Well, there was a. <laughs> I remember one day in the, um, it was a Friday afternoon, and uh, there seemed to be, I noticed that, um, I think it was, I can't remember if it was AP or, or Reuters, um, the reporter is either Terry or Steve Holland. Um, I remember walking faster than they normally yeah, did. Yeah, right. If I run in the White House, everybody's <laughs> like, oh my God, something's <laughs> happening. Yeah. Because they, they know I running, went for the wire, you know. But, they, but they, were, they were moving faster than they normally would. And then I noticed the television cameramen were, were starting to, uh, to move back to their seats at the back of the briefing room. So I wondered what it was. And, and in a little while, they announced that the president was coming in. And, uh, and it was, by that time, it was like 520. Uh -huh. And it was to announce the deal with Libya, mm -hmm. where they give up their weapons of mass destruction. But you knew it because somehow the pace changed. Yeah, you can tell a and lot by you, just... Yeah. When we were in the temporary quarters, when they were renovating the briefing room, you didn't have that. And that was a serious <laughs> problem for me because I tend to read that body language, yeah. you know, daily all day long to see 
what I might be able to nail down. And when you're not in the White House proper, you don't see it. Mm -hmm. And so we missed all that body language for many months, and it was, mm -hmm. it was difficult to know what was going on. Um, it's, uh, somebody there in the front on our, on our right, the report, the person who wants to be a reporter there who's kind of out of the street, <laughs> you had your hand up. Yeah, I'm being called out now. Um, do you prefer working for an individual news outlet or a wire service, and what are the advantages and disadvantages of both? Well, I did work for a newspaper for um, about four years. It was very difficult to move to the wire because it's, it, it's faster and it's, um, you report things in chunks. Instead of sitting back and looking at the whole story, you, you reported it in, in paragraphs, you know, and it's difficult to think that way. Uh, now I've done it for so long, I don't think I could go back. Um, so I guess I'm married to the wire for the duration. And mm -hmm. There was a time there a few years ago where I thought maybe I'd move back to the newspapers, but there's some kind of an adrenaline charge that I s tend to thrive on, and I'm not sure I could do without it at this point. I don't know if I've answered your question, but it's a personal thing, I think. I mean, if you were looking for writing more interpretive, you know, sit back and think about it pieces, you don't want to work for The Wire. If you're interested in breaking news um, and running fast, you know, with the president or whoever, whoever you're covering, then, yeah, you definitely want to work for The Wire. And another thing about working for The Wire is that even if you then go back and do newspaper work, it teaches you so much because it's so high paced um, and so fast that you're forced to be so much more accurate and so much more detail oriented that your reporting skills improve dramatically um, just from the experience and then you can go back and utilize those skills in, in a more slower paced environment. I don't know if that answered your question or not. You did. Yeah. Thank you very much, Deb. Appreciate okay. it. Very Great. good. Very good question.